Okay, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So thank you very much uh, for joining the uh, the Tiles webinar today. So it is a great uh, pleasure for me so to introduce our speaker, Professor Sujit Ravi from Department of Com uh, the Department of Earth and Environment Science at Temple University. So Professor Ravi, he is an environmental scientist interested in understanding the impacts of the land use change and the disturbance on the, the eco-hydrological process in the terrestrial ecosystems. Can I ask you? So again, thank you. Th thank you so much, Yushu. Um let me just let me say a few words and, and uh, we can start. So uh, this session consists of 40 to 45 minutes presentation and 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, we suggest attendees to ask questions at the end of the presentation. Um, as, as you should mention, we are so glad to present our today's speaker on this uh, TIES webinar series on data science for environmental sciences. Uh, Sujit Ravi also is an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science at uh, Temple University. Uh, but his work has been recognized with a faculty early career award from the National Science Foundation, the American Geophysical Union editor citation for excellence in referring, a uh, distinguished faculty award for mentoring from Temple University, an award for excellence in scholarship in the science and engineering from the University of Virginia. Uh, Dr. Ravis' uh, research addresses the challenges of managing scarce soil and water resources in the context of multiple demands and multiple constraints associated with land and use change and dis disturbances. The core challenge, which is actually the core challenge facing the futures of wars, uh, food security and environmental quality. Uh, dear Sujit, uh, thank you, really thank you. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and making time out of your really busy schedule and welcome, you may start. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ignacio and Yuzo. Um, thanks for thanks for inviting me. You can, you can hear me well, right? Yes. yes. Good. Okay. Thank you. So, um, yeah. So, uh, thanks for the introduction. So, um, so I'm a broadly trained environmental scientist, and a lot of my work has been uh, focused on looking at uh, pathways of land degradation and looking at uh, ecohydrological feedbacks um, and finding new solutions to effectively manage. Uh, land, soil and water resources. That's been the um, the major uh, theme of my research uh, in the past several years. So uh, more recently, I started work looking at um, the impacts of large scale uh, renewable energy generation and looking at ways to minimize uh, the impacts of renewable energy when we transition to a renewable energy future. All right. So um, so I just want to start uh, with this um, idea that uh, renewables. Uh, do have some impacts um, that people don't really recognize often. Uh, we never kind of think about renewables in that sense. So um, for example, um, some renewable technologies like wind and solar has a lot of, uh, has a big land footprint. The land requirement to produce energy is, is, is higher just by looking at this figure from um, recently published figure, um, looking at how much energy you need, how much energy, how much land you need to produce energy to run your television like for a year. Um, so you can see that some of the traditional, like the typical renewables actually need much more land than uh, the fossil fuel technology. So, so considering the impacts are, are lesser than fossil fuel technologies, but the land requirements are, are, are higher. So, so even technologies like biofuels require a lot of water to produce uh, the fuel, right? So because you need to grow the corn or some other biofuel and you need to irrigate that to produce that. So um, so renewables do have impacts just like, uh, so technology may, may uh, renewable technology may or may not be sustainable uh, because renewable, renewable and sustainable is not the same thing, right? Something that's renewable can or may or may, or may not be sustainable depending on how much land and water resources are going into the system plus other impacts on the environment. So one of our major research uh, early on was to look at impacts of large scale expansion of solar and to see uh, what impacts does traditional uh, construction operation of solar solar installations have on ecosystem processes or hydrological process in the system. So um, so here, um, 
So if you want to look at uh, projections for solar, which is one of the fastest uh, growing uh, renewable energy sectors. Um, so if you want to look at the projections for the US, it's, it's rapidly increasing. Uh, and if you, if you want to look at the next 10 to 20 years, you're looking at uh, four to six million acres of land, uh, direct land conversion, uh, just for solar energy uh, in the United States, right? Which is a pretty significant amount of land. And, and we are only talking about direct land conversion, right? There could be other indirect uh, use of land like transmission lines and other infrastructure related to, um, to the solar uh, infrastructures, right? So um, the question is, where is this land coming from and what impacts does solar have on the land because of the construction operation, right? So, so if you look at the, um, so the agricultural lands, so you might think that the solar installations are coming up in really far remote uh, marginal lands, but it's often not the case uh, because agricultural lands or crop lands are really appealing for solar development, right? As you can see from some of the recent uh, studies looking at uh, the potential is really high over crop lands, you know, it makes sense, right? Because you can, crop lands are often, they're pretty level flat lands uh, with a lot of exposure to sunlight and you often have a lot of uh, connectivity through roads and transmission lines and things like that. And often like in many parts of the world, uh, farmers have a better source of income by leasing the land to a solar company. So they have more uh, stable income coming from the solar power production or from the, from the rent or lease of the land compared to agricultural production, which can be uh, like, you know, can fluctuate from year to year, right? So there's a lot of potential and that's the reason why uh, this recent Nature paper kind of shows that they looked at all the solar installations in the world and kind of figured out this, um, uh, what percentage of, so of these lands are previously cultivated lands. And uh, it was interesting that almost uh, close to 50% or 45 to 50% of the existing lands were agricultural lands, right? So, so there is some uh, transformation of agricultural lands for solar, um, in different parts of the world, right? Uh, because of all these reasons. So, um, so we really need to understand the impacts, right? So this is like one of the sites I worked in uh, Northwestern India, like a few years ago, looking at um, the conversion, even if it's not an agricultural land, even if you can classify this as a wasteland, which people may not agree, right? If you convert that to a, a power plant, a traditional power plant in the desert, you are completely disturbing the soil and completely redistribute like destroying the structure of the soil and things like that. There could be impacts uh, for ecosystem processes or ecosystem functions like, like primary production and carbon sequestration, things like that, right? So there can be impacts, um, not, not just by the land uh, being taken over for solar, but also there could be impacts uh, if you don't use proper uh, mitigation strategies early on, there could be impacts on the land, like increasing soil erosion, depletion of nutrients and things like that. So um, an emerging idea that's been getting more popular nowadays is to uh, is this dual the idea of this dual use landscapes, right? Can we integrate some other activity along with solar, right? So for example, in this figure, you have a prairie with a lot of uh, providing a lot of ecological services, right, or ecosystem services, like you know primary production, carbon sequestration, or or grazing land, uh, we could even just combine them. We could just install the solar directly on this without making any changes in the uh, in the landscape and have something like a dual use landscape. So this is nothing new, right? This idea was there from the 1980s, um, but there was not many solar installations at that time. But in the last decades, there's been some work in Europe and also in the US looking at all these multifunctional landscapes and how and what kind of functions they provide. So um, an example here, there's some of the sites, there are some of our sites in, in picture, not all, but some of these are our sites that we um, that we are looking um, looking at. So you can see this, uh, they could exist in different ways. It's not just crops, it could be uh, grazing lands. It could be like a pollinator friendly landscape that provide pollination services to nearby agricultural fields, uh, or it could be um, things like, uh, this is like sites in, this is one site in inner, inner Mongolia where they're going like licorice, which is kind of a high value uh, used in medicines and things like that. Um, and there could be benefits which the solar panels might be providing the crop, you know, because it, if you're growing like extremely, growing in extremely hot climates, you might be providing a microclimate that might give you a cooler um, microclimatic conditions 
or it could reduce the wind speed, which might desiccate the crops. So there might be some benefits that the crops might provide, that the panels might provide the crops, and maybe there might be some benefits the crop might be able to provide the, the electricity generation from the panels, right? So a lot of our investigations have been looking at these multi-use landscapes. So we started looking at the impacts of solar on agricultural areas or other systems with traditional, like old cultivate, old practices of uh, disturbing the soil and other and vegetation before installing them. And we also looked at uh, this dual land use and what services they can provide. Uh, can it actually mitigate this negative impacts and provide uh, more income and other benefits to uh, to the farmers, for example? And we can also look at um, what other socioeconomic benefits in different landscape across the world, right? Because there could be different benefits in different areas based on climatic conditions and the local acceptance and things like that, that people's participation is, it matters. So we could look at all these impacts. So our general research questions were centered around this multi, multi-use landscapes, looking at feedbacks, trade-offs and, and synergies of this integration. So, um, so early on, like, like I mentioned earlier, we uh, most of our work was focused on looking at impacts. So there were a lot of there are a lot of existing solar power plants uh, which are built in a traditional view, right? traditional uh, construction practices. For example, like you remove the topsoil, you grade the soil, level the soil, uh, compact the soil. Um, there is a, kind of the older practice for solar, and we can think about revegetating some of these landscapes, right? Let's see, can you restore this landscape back to the uh, the prairie grassland, prairie, prairie or other natural lands it used to be, right? So once this experiment was done in uh, Colorado where this power plant was constructed as traditional by disturbing the soil and all these processes, and after 10 years, they decided to revegetate and try to bring it back to a natural prairie next, uh, just a natural prairie, similar to that, right? So 10 years following the revegetation, we actually went up there and looked at the soil properties and other factors to see, can you compare that to this undisturbed site nearby? Uh, interestingly, we found that it never recovered. It had like less than half the carbon and half the nitrogen compared to the natural grassland. Plus there was a lot of soil erosion happening and this heterogeneity is in, in nutrient and moisture distribution, which is induced by the panels, right? How they redistribute rainfall. So the idea here is if you construct a power plant by creating this disturbance and down, down the line, if you try to recover the landscape, it's going to be a much harder uh, process. So ideally it should happen early on when you install it and you install this infrastructures. It's better to have come up with the revegetation plan or uh, keep it undisturbed with the natural vegetation along with that. So, um, so that's one of the scenarios. So after that, we set up multiple sites to figure out what uh, what kind of treatments, uh, land treatments are, are beneficial for solar or what kind of benefits can provide, right? So we had multiple sites where we um, we have different different treatments. So we, have, we can go to a large commercial solar power plants, which could be like 100 acres or something or more. Um, and we could set up different areas of the landscape uh, in, inside the power plant. So some areas would be like bare, traditional, uh, old style solar. Uh, insulation plus we have other areas where you can have vegetation and we can also compare these to adjacent croplands nearby so these are all converted agricultural fields right so we have this huge uh this comprehensive sen sensor network where we instrument uh, the fields a lot um so we can measure above ground uh process above ground climatic conditions weather conditions and below ground processes like soil moisture and we can we're also sampling for uh, carbon nitrogen and all the nutrients so we kind of generate this, uh, these intensive data sets, uh, which could be used for uh, future analysis to, to figure out what kind of microclimatic conditions the crops experience under these panels in different climatic zones. So we can have recommendation on what could be grown realistically at these sites, right? So that is the, uh, one of the ideas that we are trying to explore. So I'm just going to show some of the um, some of the results, uh, initial results that we have been generating from these experiments. Um, we are still in kind of the initial phase. It's kind of a newer idea, so we are still have we still have like three or four years of data, and we are kind of in the process of analyzing this data sets, right? So one of the interesting things here, um, so we know we can we can guess is that the panels are going to create a heterogeneity in moisture distribution, right? Because when it rains, the panels are going to intercept the rainfall. And they're going to redistribute the precipitation based on the orientation of the panels, right? 
So you're going to get areas with, which are receiving high rainfall and areas which, which are receiving like very small amount of rainfall, right? So that's a heterogeneity that we need to address when we are trying to grow crops. You know, it could be a useful thing too if you want to create areas with where crops, where we can plant crops which require high rainfall or higher moisture requirement, higher water requirement, and we can have areas with low rainfall requirement. The same thing applies to solar radiation, right? We can have crops which like the full sun and crops which likes a little bit of less radiation from the sun, right? So we could have areas which could be uh, planted with different types of crops or different type of, um, based on their requirements, right? So the whole idea here is the, the panels redistribute rainfall and create the heterogeneity, but vegetation underneath can further redistribute or homogenize the moisture distribution because plants can redistribute moisture from areas of higher moisture to lower moisture through the root uptake, right? And these process are actually uh, more intense or more um, dominant in area in, in dry dry areas, right? Because if you want to look at um, the root distribution by uh, moisture distribution by plant root, it's going to be a more um, intense process in, in drier climates, which is also very significant, right? Because that's where the moisture requirements are more important for plant productivity, right? So you can also look at uh, the soil temperature. Um, so the panels kind of create a cooler. Um, microclimate so we have the soil temperature was much or like could be like five degrees cooler than uh, a normal field which could be beneficial in some climates right so the idea that you are creating these uh, zones with different moisture different temperature and also different uh, microclimatic conditions like you know like air temperature humidity and wind speeds right so so you are creating this fine scale microhabitats inside a solar array uh, which could be maybe beneficial or it should it could buffer uh, the, the impact of extreme temperature in some cases, right? So even uh, things like wind speed was more um, dispersed and slower when we have vegetation under under the solar panels rather than a more uh, unidirectional, faster wind speeds. You can see from the wind rose diagram down down here. So um, the bare the solar with the bare soil underneath, um, the wind speed was actually faster and is a kind of more in dominant in very few directions, but uh, when you have vegetation, it's more dispersed and it's more slower and it's more dispersed, multi-directional. And if you look, if you're working at working on pollinators like bees and things like that, uh, some of the pollinators prefer a more slower and multi-directional wind speed because it's easier to migrate from uh, one plant to the next plant, right? So, so all these things are actually creating the changes in humidity, temperature, cooler microclimate, uh, and also like pockets of areas where you can have different climatic conditions, right? So this could be impact, important for conservation or coexistence of different species in, inside the inside the solar array. So, like I said, the microclimate is something that you define based on the size of the organism, right? So depending on the size, you could have huge impacts on microclimatic conditions for different organisms, right? Because if you are like a small insect, your microclimate is defined in a very small scale spatial scale, but if you are larger, your microclimate that impacts your life is going to be a bigger spatial scale, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so basically solar arrays are creating these microclimates um, or are maintaining these microclimates, which kind of show greater uh, temperature and soil moisture heterogeneity. And that could buffer um, in senses like extreme heat and things like that, because you have areas where uh, there's some areas with cooler conditions where plants or, or animals can coexist or exist in these areas, right? So, um, and like I said, these, these, these effects will be much more prominent in, as you move on to, from like the Midwestern region to more drier climates like Arizona or something, these effects will be much more dominant, right? Because the background climate is, temperature is much, 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 much higher than the east, east of Eastern US, right? So um, we can also see changes in, in carbon in the soil, right? So, so if you look at total carbon and total nitrogen, uh, the traditional land cover with no, vegeta uh, no vegetation under the panels, uh, you tend to have higher erosion rates happening because there's less vegetation cover on the ground. So you lose fine sediments and often nutrients are attached to the fine sediments. So you kind of tend to lose carbon and nitrogen from these systems uh, leading to lower uh, ecosystem productivity. So you can see the total carbon and total nitrogen was actually much lower in the treatment, even after three years after construction, uh, on the bare sites, they were much lower. And you can also look at um, the sorting and the mean of the fee mean, which is the 
the negative log of base two uh, diameter uh, of the particles in millimeter. So you can actually take derive these things from a particle size distribution of the soil. So you can get a grain size distribution of the soil using a laser diffraction, and then you can derive these parameters from that distribution, right? So here uh, you have the phi mean on the x, uh, the phi scale uh, mean on the phi scale, which is you take the diameter of the particles in millimeters and then it transform to log negative log of the base two. So the larger the number, the smaller the particles, right? So you can see that the, the vegetated areas have a much broader distribution of particles and they are finer. Uh, so, but you get more coarser particles, a little bit more co coarser particles in the bare sites, which, which means the finer particles are being eroded out of the system, right? So a system with more diversity of particles is actually better in terms of nutrient redistribution and other properties, right? So even within three years after construction, you see signs of higher erosion happening from these bare sites and a better uh, soil conditions in the vegetated site, right? So uh, more interesting in a, um, in a hydrological perspective is um, can the panels, so we are, we are looking at how the panels were, were impacting vegetation, which could be crops or any other uh, vegetation underneath the panels. But you can also look at um, how the crops or vegetation are, is, is affecting the electricity generation from panels, which is kind of more interesting, right? So there's kind of recent studies which show that when you have crops or vegetation under the panels, there is a cooling effect that actually decreases the temperature, the operating temperature of the panels uh, by a lot in, in desert systems, and which actually brings the panel down to their optimum performance limits, like it could be around 25 degrees or, or something. That means it can actually produce more electricity because of the impact of this uh, the crop cooling effect, right? So basically your solar radiation is, um, is partitioned into the sensible heat and latent heat, right? The heat that you feel and the heat that's the energy that's used for converting water to vapor, right? When the plants are there, they're transpiring, they're releasing water. So they're using some of those radiation to convert water to vapor uh, in the process of transpiration. And actually it, it relate, it kind of, it's related to that cooling effect that you get because of the vegetation. So the crop cooling effect uh, from uh, the study by Greg Barron Gafford in Arizona kind of showed that the panels in the extreme desert system, but when they were co-located with, with crops, they were operating at 15 to 20 degrees Celsius lower than without than panels on bare ground, uh, which is kind of a huge difference in their operating conditions. And that could translate, even though that study did not show the actual electricity production, this could translate to a better performance regime for the panels and it could generate more electricity. So we really need to investigate like how much electricity generation can you get by this effect uh, and that could be significant in some some systems, but not in all the systems, right? So interestingly, like in all of our sites in the Midwestern region, uh, in Midwestern in Minnesota, for example, we did not see any impact of crop cooling on the panels. There was no effect of uh, crop cooling in the panels, and and that makes sense because you're working in a not in a moisture limited system. It's 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 not an arid climate, so. Um, the temperature differential is not that big. So the question is like, where can you get benefits and where can you find this to be a significant benefit of colligating crops with, with, with solar panels, right? So, uh, so our research kind of shows that um, basically looking at evapotranspiration, which is responsible for the cooling um, and that that's affected by, um, so you take a reference crop value and then you multiply with the crop coefficient to get the actual uh, crop evapotranspiration, that's um, the idea here. So when you have dry soil, when you have wet soil, uh, the water is evaporating with no, no restriction, right? Because it's like free water. So it's it's evaporating at a very high rate. Um, so the coefficient is like, is close to one. Um, so the potential is potential evapotranspiration and the actual evapotranspiration are actually closer. So when the soil dries out after Few, few hours or few days after rainfall event, it's harder for water to evaporate from the soil. So the evaporation rate goes down to a low value because when the top, top soil dries out, it's harder for moisture to, to move across this, move from the soil, deeper layers to the surface. So the evaporation goes down to a, to a very low value, right? But if you have crops instead of bare soil, the crops have deeper root systems, they can pull water from deeper areas and transpire, right? 
So that's a big difference between the dry soil and um, and the vegetated surface, right? So if the soil is kept consistently moist, like in our sites in Minnesota, where the rainfall happens every couple of days on average, uh, the evaporation from bare soil might be even comparable, even greater, greater than transpiration, evapotranspiration from a crop cropped area, right? But that could be completely different for a desert system where the soil dries down immediately, but the plants are transpiring, that makes a huge difference, right? So the cooling effects might be more amplified in, in drier climates, and we can actually make the predict that based on how often the rainfall comes back, the rainfall frequency that keeps the soil, soil wet, and also uh, so your background climate and the precipitation frequency can tell you that. So we can actually model that. Uh, that. So if you're so if you're looking at this top area with the blue line, where the rainfall on an average happens every day, the soil is consistently wet, so your coefficient is really high, and it could be even higher than a crop. But if your rainfall happens like once in 20 days, so the soil is most of the time the bare soil is dry, that means your evapotranspiration drops down much faster, so you don't really get a cooling effect. So, so it makes sense that you can actually look at um, like a global data sets and see which areas can you get these benefits on power production by solar panels, right? Or electricity generation from solar panels and where these benefits are significant and where these benefits are not significant, right? Just by looking at the background climate and um, and the, and the uh, background climate and other factors, right? That we just described here. So the idea that you can get this cooling effect in drylands is not, is only one side of the story, right? Because to maintain crops or vegetation at high level of evapotranspiration or high, highest potential of transpiration, you need to add a lot of irrigation water, right? So it comes at a cost of irrigation water. And also if you're trying to grow crops in a desert system, you probably need a lot of amendments to the soil and things like that to create that ideal conditions for crop productivity because a lot of these areas are marginal lands, right? So that's one thing to consider is that we really need to look at these uh, trade-offs in, in terms of irrigation. So if you look at this model evapotranspiration and how that changes with temperature and how how, the, how they differ with two different moisture regimes, the difference is actually the, the amount of irrigation you need to keep the keep the plants at that optimum evapotranspiration, right? So we can actually do that analysis on, on a larger scale. That's something that we are currently working on to, to look at global data sets and see which areas can you grow, um, can you couple vegetation and solar, and in which areas can you actually increase electricity generation, which could be a, a driving factor for uh, implementation, because that's something that the solar de developers want to see, right? Because you're also increasing, not just you're improving the ecosystem functions in the system, you're also increasing um, the productivity of the landscape and also energy production. So. Other benefits you can see from this figure of uh, evapotranspiration on the side on the side is um, the shading might provide a little bit lower temperature in some areas, especially in extremely hot climates, and that might actually improve uh, the performance of the plants. Right. So an example here. So the overall story here: the effects of crop cooling and electricity generation, which are really interesting, are they are like very site specific, uh, even though they're they are really important in some areas, it comes at the cost of irrigation and other uh, investments for agriculture to, to maintain that crop production in those areas, right? So uh, another um, interesting idea here that I just want to put this idea forward so we can also evaluate that looking at uh, global data sets is to see, can we, uh, is this collocation, is, is this a way, agricultural tags, is this a way to expand agriculture in areas where previously you could not have agriculture, right? For example, extremely desert margins or something, it's too hot and the sun is like too intense that you cannot grow anything. But with this additional microclimatic feedback that you get from the solar panels, can you grow crops there? And that's kind of an interesting question because there's an option to expand agriculture in areas in the, into these areas, right? So an example here will be how the photosynthesis, right? Which is how plants fix uh, carbon from the atmosphere, plant productivity is related to solar radiation, right? So when you increase solar radiation, you get an increase in photosynthesis, but only up to up to a point. And for some plants, um, not all plants, but some plants, there's actually a decline in very high solar intensity, solar intensity too, right? So in this case, if you're decreasing solar radiation uh, in the extremely high light intensity areas, 
that might benefit the plant, right? Because it might benefit the plant by um, bringing it to a more desirable range, optimum range of solar radiation. So you can do that by in including shade or, or using different configuration of solar panels. You can, you can reduce the sunlight hitting the plants, right? So it could be a way to increase the range of plants in some areas. A more important aspect is the idea that uh, the temperature is a bigger determinant of plant productivity than um, solar radiation in many cases, because uh, the optimum range of temperature, there's an optimum range of temperature for every plant or every crop. So these are three different photosynthetic mechanisms ranging from C3 plants, which are most of the trees. Majority of the plants are C3 mechanisms for photosynthesis. And then we have C4 plants, which are more like warm season grasses and things like that. And the camp plants are more like cacti and plants, right? So they all have different optimum range of temperature for their growth, right? So if, you have, if you're producing shade, you're also decreasing the temperature, right? And, uh, because of, <clears throat> of the microclimatic effect, so declining temperature, for example, from 40 to 30 degrees Celsius might increase uh, the productivity range for some plants, right? Depending on the photosynthetic mechanism. So there could be uh, ways where we could expand the range of agriculture using this idea of agrovoltaics in some systems, right? So that could be explored using uh, existing data sets to see where we can expand agriculture and what could be the, the food production we can achieve by expanding that agriculture into those areas. So along with that, we can also get savings of water um, efficiency, right? We could also improve the water efficiency. Some studies have shown that agrovoltaics are actually improving water efficiency when plants are sheltered by the panels. They are not exposed to extreme sunlight and they have a cooling effect. So they might be losing less water by transpiration because they don't need to worry about the extreme heat, right? So that also brings to the question of like, um, there's predict the crop yields are predicted to decline in the next few decades. Uh, because of uh, the extreme heat is one of the reasons. The temperature is going to be one of the reasons for declining crop, crop yields. So maybe this kind of systems might be a solution in, in some areas, like not, all, not in all areas, not the solution for everything, but it could be a solution in some areas where we could design these systems to provide a microclimate, which could buffer some of this effect of higher, higher temperature extremes, right? So, um, so that was some of the work, um, the current work that we are doing is to look at this larger data sets and try to make some predictions about what kind of benefits uh, you can get from collocation and, and how that depends on regional factors, right? Like soil, climate, other feedbacks in the system. So, uh, so now I just wanna show uh, some of these examples deriving from all these ideas that we discussed, uh, the microclimatic effects. So what kind of collocation scenarios can we achieve in different areas? So I just want to uh, bring your attention to some of these uh, feedbacks. So, so in the last 10 years, we have been looking at all these different systems in around the world to see like what kind of benefits can, you can get in different areas. So what kind of new applications can you get from agroalty? So we looked at crops, biofuels, um, other areas like off-grid, um, geographically isolated areas, uh, in different parts of the world and see like what kind of benefits these collocations can bring. So here we are using like more um, modeling work, like we're using more life cycle model, life cycle analysis of uh, collocation, both looking at um, emissions, energy inputs and outputs, and also looking at the economic aspects of these collocated systems, right? So uh, uh, the first example would be uh, the idea that I talked about being in the desert systems you can get a lot of benefits, but you need a lot of irrigation water, right? And, you, uh, and if you're familiar with a lot of the desert systems in, in the US, it's harder to grow typical food crops in these systems, right? Because the soil is not very productive. So, so you cannot really grow like rice or wheat in, in, in kind of a marginal desert, desert land, right? So, but we can also, but we can grow, we can look at plants like, uh, which are related to cacti, like the cam plants, like agave and aloe, which are, which grow really well in desert system. They're adapted to desert. They can bring high productivity in these systems and they survive without any additional water requirement in these systems, right? And some of these plants like agave is a good biofuel choice, uh, like a non-traditional biofuel crop because we already know how to make alcohol from agave because of the tequila industry. But this, in this case, it's mostly used as a biofuel. The whole plant can be used as a biofuel and they can have significant productivity in these areas without any moisture input. And in some cases, interestingly, we have this additional water input in these areas because of uh, the panel washing. You need to clean the panel once a week or something because 
in the desert system, the dust settles on the panels and it decreases the power output. So you need to clean the panels to make them uh, and functioning at that optimum level, right? So this water pretty much is wasted in most systems and this could be added on to that crop production system. Uh, and with additional water requirements, it could be a significant part of this background to precipitation in some areas that we found, which could increase the productivity of these crops and uh, could be an economical, economically viable system. So, um, so the idea here, you're getting more dollar per uh, unit of water and land use in these systems. And the crops might even benefit from the shading and other uh, microclimatic factors that the, the panels provide. Um, and the more important idea here is um, you can grow a lot of biofuel crops, the non-traditional biofuel crops in marginal lands, uh, which is really significant because you can use your prime agricultural lands for the major food commodities, right? So you don't just so you can decrease the competition between biofuel crops and the food crops in prime for prime agricultural lands, right? So we explore this condition for uh, the southwestern U.S. and area, areas of Mexico looking at this agave and also looked at aloe, which is another highly valuable plant in terms of the organic food industry and cosmetics and things like that, which are high value crops. So um, interestingly, these crops have some interesting um, characters which makes them viable under uh, for collocation because they last for long periods of time. They can go to like three to five years uh, cropping cycle. They actually need a lot of manual labor in these systems, like in Mexico or in Northwestern India. There's a lot of manual labor that's involved in agriculture um, because sometimes in existing solar arrays, it's harder to bring in machinery because of the, the panels and other infrastructure. So you can keep the labor there. And some of the recent studies have shown that the, the working conditions under the panels are actually much better than just working out in the desert because of this cooler microclimate, even for humans, right? So, uh, so we have published some of these, some of these studies um, on looking at these non-traditional biofuel crops and high value crops in the desert systems. Um, and um, another example here is looking at uh, off-grid scenarios. Um, so we are kind of moving from this uh, desert systems to something that's more surprising is more like uh, tropical areas where um, there's this issue of geographically isolated areas, which it's harder to connect with the grid, right? So Indonesia is the typical example. It's a group of uh, 17,000 islands. Uh, over 900 islands have people living in them. And some of these islands are not electrified uh, because the population size is too small and it's very hard to get grid across the ocean. So it's kind of, um, so a lot of the power source coming for, for agriculture, which is the dominant industry in this, in this region is large diesel generators. So there's this, um, the push to convert some of these uh, diesel generators to or offset or retrofit some of these generators with solar in some of these areas. But since agricultural land is kind of a prime commodity there, people are not willing to give up land. And also the land size sizes are much smaller compared to the US. So we cannot really go for a, um, a solar centric uh, agrovoltaic system there. Right? You cannot go create a large power plant and have crops in there. So we have to think differently so we, for ways to in, incorporate renewable energy into their existing infrastructure, right? So, um, so one of the ideas we tested there was a lot of farmers were using shades to grow some crops under, under the shade because they prefer those conditions like a, like a rainforest canopy. So, so one, of, one of the aspects is we can convince the farmers to re replace those shades with, with panels, right? That's more like a energy electricity generating shade. That's like one approach. So one of the aspects we tried was we tried this one of this high value crop called pacholi, which is the base for a lot of the perfumes in the world. And it's a high value crop and farmers, they, it, it does well in the shade. So we looked at this analysis of um, collocating um, this plant with solar in different configurations. And we looked at all these energetics and other uh, emissions, energy and economics of the system. I'm just going to show um, one example here. So if you're looking at the net percent value of these systems with different intensity of solar, right? So either you can have a complete crop, that's the one on the on the right, or you could have a mix of crop and panels with different densities. So you're not you're only packing the system with half of the panels compared to like the full intensity, right? So uh, you can see that um, all these values are negative because off grid solar is still, even though it's going down, it's still not economically feasible in many areas because the installation costs are very high. And 
And we have not included any of the subsidies in this calculation. That's why a lot of these NPV values are negative, right? So, but you can see that with, with, an, with an addition of crop collocated systems, the net present value is actually moving towards a profitability range, which is about zero, right? So it's going towards the right. And with the decrease in price of solar and subsidies, it's going to bring um, the, the whole thing, whole distributions to the right, right? More profitability level. So here it's interesting is because when you decrease the number of panels or density of the solar, you're actually getting more light into the system. That means you can grow crops and the whole cost of the system goes down, right? Because uh, the panels are the most expensive commodity in those areas. And you don't, you don't really need a higher, higher electricity generation at these areas because the population sizes in, in these villages are very small. So you can also look at how uh, a hypothetical one uh, hectare solar array in a village and see how much electricity can it generate. You can model the electricity generation in that system. And you can see that the actual consumption of electricity is actually one third of what could be produced from a one hectare solar array, which is a very small solar array in the US. But in many of the islands in Indonesia, you could have one third of that system and still produce the power, right? So we also looked at options to use that extra power so we can actually start more industries and more, so we can also make like some social changes in the system because we have more electricity to power uh, processing industries. We can process agriculture commodities. We can, we can also start like more in employment opportunities. We can do like uh, educational things or internet kiosk and hospitals and things like that that could bring social changes in these areas where they did not have access to electricity early on, right? So. That's a good thing. So we can actually decrease the number of panels in the system, make the system economical, but they still can satisfy most of the power, power demands in the system or even more um, or newer industries in the system, right? Um, so right now we are working more towards uh, this uh, decentralized systems where we could um, crop collocation. This collocation could be with any other industry. So it could be installing solar with a coffee drying system or an aquaculture plant or, or crops, right? And these are very small scale systems, but we could find ways to integrate them and make them function as a microgrid too, right? Because they all can function as a microgrid. And these are actually more resilient if you have extreme weather events. And if you knock out one of these one of the nodes, you still have, it's easy to put, put the system back into function. Um, and, and a lot of this, Activities here, looking at uh, if you're drying coffee or cocoa, or if you are trying to oxygenate a pond for aquaculture, the intermittency of solar is not a big issue here because if you're trying to dry uh, coffee beans or something, it doesn't really matter when the fan runs, right? As long as it runs during some part of the day, it makes the crop product better. So you can actually, you don't even need to use a lot of this um, um, batteries and other inverters that that makes the pro project much more expensive, right? So so we can look at a lot of a lot of the synergies in this uh, non-traditional system, like in a, a tropical system, isolated, geographically isolated. Same thing applies to higher altitude regions, so isolated communities in higher altitude regions, like you know, could be in the foothills of Himalayas or something, right? So this integration is possible there too. So um, another example here is um, the idea of um, solar grazing, which is getting more and more popular. Uh, it, which makes sense, right? Because you have vegetation with the solar. One way to manage vegetation is by having some grazing animals, right? So you could have some kind of grazing, managed grazing where you could bring sheep into the system for a couple of weeks in a year and then take them to a different site. So we can do this rotational grazing system where you're not continuously grazing and putting pressure on the, on the landscape, but you are just doing this uh, managed grazing that might benefit the soil in the long run, right? Um, so one of the analysis that one of my students did was to look at uh, the productivity of a lot of these typical range plants in temperate regions and how they perform under shade. So this is not under solar panels. This is just under shade. So what she found was that um, a lot of the plants actually benefit from shade. And some of the productivity is even higher under shade, even with 50% shade or even 80% shade. So that means you, could, you can get significant or meaningful productivity under these panels in these systems and could be used as a grazing uh, area. So along with that, with managed grazing, we found that there's a significant increase in total carbon and total nitrogen in these systems with managed grazing under the panels. So this is a very efficient way to manage vegetation compared to like mowing or other using other herbicides and things like that. But you can, you can use the sheep, generate another income source, 
plus you'll be improving the soil quality in some of these areas with um, with addition of organic matter into these systems, right? So if you look, look at the difference in total carbon and total nitrogen from a control area outside, which is an agricultural field outside uh, the solar array, with grazing, you can see that with respect to that baseline conditions, you're actually increasing uh, the, the total carbon nitrogen. And it uh, it's not a, a linear increase for every site. It's not, it doesn't, does not depend on number of grazing events. It also depends on soil properties and other things in the system too, right? But in overall, across the board, we, we saw an increase in total carbon and total nitrogen with this grazing treatment, with the number of years of grazing treatment. So we can also look at other um, elements in the system. So here, um, the spider uh, diagram kind of shows the 0% is the baseline control site outside the solar array. And then we have orange is the bare solar site with bare no vegetation. And then the green is a solar. So it's showing the percentage increase from the control side zero. So you can see most of the nutrients are actually increasing with vegetation and managed grazing compared to like the bare site or even the control site, which is actually pretty promising because with managed grazing, you could actually improve uh, the, the productivity of the land for later crop production. Um, so right now we are looking at a holistic idea to holistic evaluation of soil quality in sites. So we're looking at whole series of nutrients, organic carbon. We are measuring how water moves in the landscapes. We're looking at soil compaction and also looking at a holistic soil food web, like an example shown here. We are looking at uh, the total micro the microbial activity in the soil, the mycorrhizal fungi, everything compared to an adjacent land, control land, right? So we can see across the board, there's an increase in microbial activity uh, with grazing and vegetation at solar sites compared to a non-solar agricultural field nearby. So, so this is pretty significant because with time, so if you're leasing out a land to a solar company, your productivity might be increasing uh, with this novel management techniques or site management techniques, you might be increasing the quality of the land. And, and, and there was a recent publication that came out, look, they looked at the decline in soil organic carbon around the world and found that a lot of areas are actually depleted of carbon because of intense agriculture for last hundreds of years. There's a paper from Sander Mann in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science published in 2017. That's a figure from that paper. So we can actually see that a lot of this, in a lot of the areas we are working on currently uh, in the grazing study, uh, there's a lot of depletion of organic carbon from the soil because of human activity, uh, because of more agriculture, traditional agriculture, more erosion. So these areas are actually at, sitting at a lower carbon storage and there's a lot of potential to add carbon in, the, in these areas. So if you're leasing your land, the part of your agricultural land to uh, these uh, integrated solar agricultural grazing systems, there might be options to increase the carbon storage along with other nutrients and improve the soil quality. And you might be getting back a more rejuvenated agricultural land after um, 25 years of the lifetime of the solar. So your benefits might be, uh, might, uh, might be much better than um, the typical land uh, might have much productive land after 25 years of the lifespan of the solar, right? So there's some interesting questions to look uh, So how much carbon you can fix in different sites, which might be a function of the background climate and how much carbon you already have in the system and also the soil properties. That's something that we are trying to model uh, in the future. So um, another system will be uh, looking at um, urban systems that we are trying out in Philadelphia. We start a new project looking at these urban systems, food production systems, which combine solar renewable energy and crops or, or some aesthetic locations, or can it provide services like producing vegetables in areas like food deserts in the cities, or can it work for stormwater management or community gardens and things like that. Um, and we can use that for recharging elect electric vehicles and things like that. That's one of the ideas that we are working on currently. And it could be a rooftop too, right? Which is another option in many cities, right? Rooftop uh, agrotikes is, is another emerging idea. So um, just to summarize, so, we, so I'm just throwing like a bunch of these ideas where uh, you can actually see a lot of applications for uh, integrating data sciences mm -hmm. and, and statistical techniques to uh, to scale up a lot of these experiments, right? Still, this is a kind of a novel concept and a lot of the studies are actually in the early phase. So you will see like more projects coming up in the future. Um, so from our last several years of work, we can actually see there is potential in this dual use land. Uh, and But you have to kind of design these systems appropriately for different um, locations in the world, right? So 
and a large solar array with crops might be okay for the United States, but uh, a crop-centric approach might be good for some countries in Asia where the land is a is a commodity, right? Land is an important commodity that needs to be needs to be uh, increased. Uh, you need to use efficiently, right? So, um, and there is, like I mentioned, there's opportunity to expand agriculture, and we need to figure out what what extent we can expand based on uh, the data that we have, right? Looking at the climatic data, and there are ways to utilize marginal lands for, for example, for biofuel production that we can. Uh, you can keep your prime agricultural lands for food production, um, and there there are ways to maintain labor in areas, which is which could be important in some areas in some countries in Asia where you have a lot of landless agricultural laborers. Which uh, and if you're converting a large crop area like a hundred like a several kilometer square area of farm into a solar array, you only need like a couple of people to manage the solar site instead of like hundreds of people or thousands of people working in as agricultural laborers, right? So if you are, if we can keep the agriculture along with solar, we could still maintain the labor in those areas. Uh, and also the idea that this co-benefits that I talked about are, are completely site specific, right? So one benefit that dominates in an area might be irrelevant in a different area. So we should carefully plan these systems to, uh, to kind of target those benefits, which are significant in those areas. So, um, so along with that, I think it's time. So along with that, I uh, just want to thank my funding sources from NSF and DOE and also my students and uh, both PhD students and undergraduates um, and also my collaborators. Uh, and also I want, I kind of just want to get your attention to this uh, Inspire project, which I'm also part on. So we are, I'm, I'm actually part of this project too. So we are kind of a group of, uh, universities and uh, solar companies and the national labs working on this general idea of agrovoltaics and different systems and integrating data. Um, and we have like a common um, website where we share uh, publications and data sets. And uh, we are kind of in the third phase. Uh, we are in Inspire 3 now. Um, and we recently published uh, two of our um, reports, which kind of synthesize a lot of the findings um, of agrovoltaic systems from different parts of the US. Um, Okay, so um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for your attention. So um, I'll take questions, right? Thank you so much, Sujit. Uh, first of all, I invite everyone to mode, mode, mode uh, their microphone and let us give a round of applause to Sujit for this very complete presentation. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, if any of the attendees wish to ask any question, please feel free to unmute yourself. Also, uh, you may write questions in the chat if you if you want to. This is Abdul El Sharawi. I just wonder if it's possible to share the slides and give us some information about the uh, group work that you said the number of universities are jointly doing. Yeah, sure. I'll be happy to share the slides. Yeah. Also, the recordings are going to be posted. So uh, <laughs> that's great because we can uh, see the slides and also uh, watch again, uh, hear uh, our speaker. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Also, if you if you send us the slide, such it, we can put uh, post that in the in the website. OK, yeah, I can I can send the slides. Yeah, thank you. We really appreciate it. The other thing that I would like to ask you, you are talking about expanding the agricultural areas and intensifying the production, increasing the production of uh, the agriculture in a, particular, in a particular area. Have you looked at the problem of the, uh, or the, the group have, they looked at the problem of the rise of the water level of the oceans, because you are giving some islands in Indonesia and probably in many other places, and there will be shrinking in the land, and then there will be salination that might affect the physical characteristic of the soil itself. Yeah. So I just wonder about the, the, the issue because it's a quite, a quite wide, really, quite large. Uh -huh. And there is a problem with the security of food. Yeah. 
we will learn. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the idea of expanding agriculture was more looking at uh, the areas which are the temperature is limiting crop production right now, right? Because there are areas with solar radiation is too intense or the wind is too dry and desiccates the plant or or there are areas with um, like high temperature that prevents uh, crop growth. But with carefully designing these systems, we could decrease the solar radiation to the ideal limit of the plant for productivity and also uh, increase create a microclimate that's beneficial for the plant, maybe decreasing the temperature by, so if, you're, if your temperature is like five degrees higher than your optimum uh, productivity regime for the plant, you could decrease that temperature to the optimum range for the plant so you could you can maintain the productivity. So the case in Indonesia was uh, a little bit different. So um, the Indonesia, uh, we are not trying to expand agricultural production the idea, idea is that the Indonesia doesn't, they don't have large power plants like in the US. We don't have power plants. Indonesia doesn't have power plants which are like, you know, square kilometers long, right? Because a lot of these areas there, some of the islands have like maybe a thousand families or a couple thousand people living in there. So they don't want to give up land for large solar arrays, right? And also their electricity demands are not that high in those areas. So we could decrease the number of panels that you place so rather than looking at a solar solar centric approach that we follow in the US where we try to pack the land with as much solar as possible and then try to grow some crops in between we can we can think about a crop centric system where we, it's just a crop field but you're trying to put some panels in there uh, which makes economical sense in these areas because the solar panels are the most expensive commodity so there in, in Indonesia in this case we are not looking at expanding agriculture we are just trying to integrate solar into the existing lifestyle, right? So your concern is correct because you have those areas are also experiencing more extreme weather events like um, rising sea level and um, hurricanes and um, extreme rainfall, things like that. But even in those kind of scenarios, uh, there are some recent studies which show that solar is actually can be more resilient, right? Because once your power system is disrupted, it's easier to put back solar than other some of the other technologies, like you know, comparing solar panels to um, like a thermal power plant, right? If your power plant breaks down, it, it takes more time to set it up. But if it's a solar, it's a matter of shipping like newer uh, panels and setting up the grid, right? And also more a decentralized grid is ensures that there is more stability, right? Because you have smaller paths, smaller pieces of the grid in different parts of the island. So you have a better um, more resilient system. That's what I think. Um, that's what we want to explore those options, right? Um, so just to be clear, for Indonesia, we are not trying to. We are not looking at the idea of expanding agriculture. We are trying to just bring in electricity to areas with no electricity. That is the key idea, right? But the expansion, of, yeah, the expansion of crop yeah. comes in more desert systems. Maybe like in the Middle East, areas in the Middle East where you cannot grow anything now. In in areas where you cannot grow much, you could bring. You could create this microclimate where you could produce energy and also grow something underneath that, right? Yeah. And, yeah, and also, the, uh, also the salinization question is really interesting because we're also working in some areas. We are also planning to work in some areas where in the U.S. where uh, croplands are affected by salinity. And the one of the ideas is to decrease the evaporation because evaporation actually increases the extent of salinity in those soils. So we could decrease the evaporation and bint in those areas by using panels, which could be a potential benefit in these areas. Or, or if your area salinization is too high, you cannot grow agricultural crops because the soil salinity limits crop production. Uh, and those areas could be specifically targeted for solar development, right? Because that could be, instead of generating an income from agriculture, you could generate an income from solar in those areas, right? So instead of targeting prime crop lands, we could target areas which are not good for cultivation, right? In the same same farmers field probably, right? There could be some areas which are not good for crop growth. We could target them for solar and maybe have some rangelands or something along with that, right? Thanks. Thank you so much, Sujit. Uh, there is another question in the chat. So let me read it. This is from Cedric Pitot. Um, it is about your first slides. Uh, do the land area impacts of coal and nuclear and even solar and wind, etc., include land for mining input materials or just the footprint of the power plants? 
No, I think it, it includes everything. Uh, not just the power plant. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, it, I think it includes. Uh, yeah. Uh, is there any other question from the audience? Yeah, I have one question. Yeah, so much to this is very interesting talk and uh, very nice. So yeah, so um, so when you talk about uh, when when you do the comparison between the the vegetation PV and the the base the bell PV for the I mean for the total nitrogen and the carbon levels. Mm -hmm. So so you give some I mean some the bar charts, but somehow somehow I, I'm not I don't know. Uh, so I'm wondering. So why the the, the standard deviation, for example, for the for the vegetation PV is, I mean, it's much higher than the bell PV in the carbon this scenario. Here, yeah, here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the heterogeneity was much higher for. I I think it's probably because um there's a lot of heterogeneity because how um the water availability and light availability in that system is very different. Is very heterogeneous, mm -hmm. and that might be. I, I, I'm not completely sure, but I think that could be the reason because it it affects the vegetation establishment in different regions, right? Mm -hmm. And also the microbial activity, which affects the nutrient availability, right? Mm -hmm. The different areas, like I showed in the earlier slides, you know, different areas. There's heterogeneity created by the panels, right? right? So some areas have a lot of moisture, some areas have don't moist, don't much moisture. And there's a temperature heterogeneity, there is a soil moisture heterogeneity, there's a radiation heterogeneity. So that might be a factor, but it's a good point, right? There is some, um, there's a bigger distribution of, um, yeah, the standard deviation is much higher for sure. Yeah. 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 I see. Yes. Yeah. But also the concern, the fact that it's just the same vegetation, right? It's a mixture of, um, of native, pollinator friendly vegetation. We are not trying to grow. So we could pick up areas with, specific moisture like you know areas with high moisture and low moisture in the in the in the solar array we could also pick up areas with high solar radiation and low solar radiation right mm -hmm. so if you are planning to grow crops that's something the heterogeneity might be something that you could use for your advantage right mm -hmm. so you I could uh, you could grow crops with which needs a lot of rainfall in one band and then you have another band with crops which doesn't like sunlight or like more than light right so a lot of these areas in Indonesia, people grow, um, mm -hmm. some of the sites we worked in, people actually create these large areas with shade so they can have uh, seedlings underneath that for a nursery or something, right? Mm -hmm. So they only want like 50% of the sunlight and they're just using like like plastic shades, right? So you could just remove the shades and create, uh, use panels, which could completely change on and also generating energy, right? And offset the diesel generators a lot, so. Yeah. I see, I see. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that that makes sense. That makes total sense. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Sujit. Uh, thank you for all your questions. For now, we are going to stop the recording, but we can continue the discussions afterwards. Please remember to visit our website to keep you updated on the next speakers and and events.